approaching the rendezvous point outside Atari space. Helm, bring us out of war. Dropping to impulse. Ionic interference surging, Captain. Shield integrity holding. We can take it. We are at the correct coordinates to meet the shuttle. Commander Rydeck, find us our diplomat, if you will. Aye, Captain. Let's reduce the noise. Filter out environmental signals. I can manually tune what's left for Federation signal types. I've located the shuttle. Open in comms. On screen. Shuttle to Resolute. Shuttle to Resolute. Debris field. Lost maneuvering. Losing. I can't get it any clearer. We won't get a transporter lock. It's just not happening. Power up the tractor beam. We'll pull them directly into the docking bay. Diaz, you good to run the tractor emitter? Yes, sir. Uh, you sure? I'm sure. Come on, Diaz. First thing, lock onto the shuttle and stabilize the rotation. There's a large piece of debris headed for the shuttle. The tractor beam can't handle it. Can our shields take it? I believe so. Commander Ryder, plot an intercept course. On it. Maneuvering thrusters bearing 53 Mark 17, 200 meters on an intercept course. Maneuvering. Got it. Whoa! Someone's working hard on the bridge. Shuttlecraft on board. Good job. We're on our way down to meet them. Terra firma, so to speak. Ambassador Spock. Captain, we'll be right down to meet you, sir. In that case, I will wait for him here.
Let me be the first to say, welcome to the Resolute, Ambassador. Thank you, Petty Officer... Uh... Carter? Carter Diaz, sir. I am pleased to meet you, Petty Officer Carter Diaz. It appears I have you to thank for my safe arrival. Your assistance arrived not a moment too soon, if I may say so. You're very welcome, sir. I'm glad we could get you here in one piece. Indeed. We thought we were prepared for our arrival in Hotari space, but it is evident my craft was not sufficiently robust for such intense ionic activity. The storm has been pretty intense. There was an element that was most unusual. Before you came to our aid, our maneuvering thrusters and impulse engines were rendered inoperable. So we attempted a short traversal at warp speed, only to find that we could not achieve warp at all. Even though our diagnostics computer showed no faults or anomalies. What do you make of that? When all indications say that warp speed is possible, but in practice, we find it is not. Well, this storm is one of the strangest phenomena we've ever encountered. It's disrupted other systems. Who knows what it might do to a warp drive? Yes, it would seem further investigation is called for. Take readings, run some additional diagnostic checks, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Quite logical, Petty Officer Diaz. Thank you. Ambassador Spock. Excuse me. I'm honored to have you aboard. I'd like to get right to it. We're already behind. Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. Your experience comes from the past. But our present situation calls for it. True enough. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olydia and Hotari. The Olydians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Olydians have shared a mining operation there. The Olydians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Olydians from their system. That is the official story, as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the ionic interference. Hmm. Have the Elidians retaliated against the Hotari, or taken any action against them? Surprisingly, they have not yet responded in kind. They were open to a Federation presence, but it is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would stand a chance against the Elidian fleet in open war. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. 
Clearly the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hatari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective, after all. That is correct. The Hotari just won their independence. It's hard to believe they would give that up just for profit. I agree. It would be exceedingly difficult to bring the Hotari to that position. Neither the Elidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation. So we can't make them do anything. There is... An additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Elidians as a source of dilithium. That certainly changes things. Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah, and this is one of them. That means the Hotari have no reason to trust us. I wouldn't go that far, Commander. We are completely neutral in this matter, on neither one side nor the other. Any suggestion otherwise would compromise our position. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium Dilithium trade, Captain Solano and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is if this whole thing unravels and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength. We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship, and the Ambassador's shuttle. We have to assume the Elidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotari systems have been noted in the past. But they have never been observed on the orders of magnitude we have seen in recent weeks. If it's keeping the two sides talking instead of shooting at each other, that actually helps us negotiate a peace. And we'll take advantage of that as long as it works in our favor. And when it doesn't? All the more reason to learn as much about it as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught unprepared, should the energy anomaly continue to fluctuate. So I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook. I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Aye, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I want to speak to both of you privately. Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander, as you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But, but someone in an unofficial capacity, but someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. She certainly goes her own way. Maybe that helps in this case. It would be unconventional. I'm honored to be included in the negotiation process. You're not just included. You are instrumental. Well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and the prospect for peace may very well depend on Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. 
I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments, but I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. I am not the chief engineer of this shuttlecraft. But when you look at it logically, yes, it is just a shuttle. No different than any of the others. There is plenty that is different about it, and that is what you are to investigate. But please limit your findings to observable scientific phenomena. We'll try to restrain ourselves. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. It seems like he's warming up to us. Yeah. Even Chobok has to look at that face and know you've earned some real respect. And I have to admit that I owe you one. You were right to make me go first. I don't know what I was thinking. You did the smart thing. You've pulled me out of trouble how many times? Call it even. Okay. At the very least, maybe I can track down that bottle of sorry and brandy you're still on the hook for. But first, we have work to do. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. So... I know about your talk with Miranda. You... you do? She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later, I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. All because things went south and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't gonna work for me. You really don't believe in me, huh? It's not you. Or her. Just running the numbers, and things don't work out more often than they do. I like my friends, and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done yet? Yeah, it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. The backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? Subspace variants out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings, and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. They're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance, or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked, or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. 
Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil. I checked every coil on the port nacelle for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So, it must be the navigation array. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. Hey. I'm not here. We're escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. You're the one with the important job to do. Keeping the captain safe. And... Ambassador Spock. It doesn't always feel that way. Baking in the hot sun, standing guard next to an empty shuttlecraft. But it has its moments. Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari. Is that another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole, uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Catch y'all later. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. That was nice. Yeah, it was. Save some of that for when I get back. You've got a deal. Be seeing you. It's Larda Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go.
All right, where were we? So, the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You want to take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands-on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double-check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and a cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure returned non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, warp 1.1. 1.2. One point three. Warp pressure is destabilized. Error in warp field calculation. The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. What oh? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space. Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. It's very nice to meet you. Likewise, I hope... These must be the representatives of the mighty Federation. The reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But, either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron. The heroes of the revolt in the mines.
Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. I think we're about to begin. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. Something about his tone tells me this won't be easy. That was my sense as well. My diary speaks for all of Hotari. So I would urge patience until we speak with their queen. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Holtari Prime. The honor is mine, Your Majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Holtari people and their queen, but a recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elydian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. Saying this wouldn't be easy was an understatement. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Cobliard? She's not part She can of... speak for herself, can't she? Then let her. Now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. Being a Kobliard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Kobliard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Elidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Kobliard suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. 
There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydak. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No. It was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our minds. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth, not your Federation rhetoric. As Ambassador Spock has said, We've come seeking a peaceful resolution to this conflict, and have no interest in your dilithium. I'm not nearly as naive as you must think. The Federation has done business with the Illidians for decades, which makes me question your motives. What they haven't said, but cannot deny, is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone. Especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before Dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. So tell me, who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on town? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidians? It can only be one or the other, not both. If I have to choose only one, then it would have to be the Hotari. Well said! How could the just and wise Federation make any other choice? <gasps> this is an outrage! The Federation has lost all credibility! The mines are ours! Lydia will not be deterred! We will take back our mines by any means necessary! Then you will see more blood spilled! I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I suppose there is some sense to that. I hope we meet again, Jara Ryder. Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? 